Good afternoon, and welcome back to the afternoon session of Day 2 of Budget Deliberations 2022. We are currently in the public services bucket. Next on the agenda is transit, and I'll recognize Councillor Bressy. Great. Thank you, Mayor Clayton. I would move that committee amend the transit operational budget to add $100,000 to enhance service to residents who require transportation outside of current operational hours and direct administration to report back by the end of Q1 2023 with how the service could be delivered. And just to speak to this, I know that we've been undergoing a transit redesign, which I think was much needed in this community. And I know it's had issues, but our administration's done a very good job of listening to residents, as we're going to see with changes coming up in the next week and a half or so. That being said, one issue that, I, that I'm skeptical could be resolved without further resources is residents who just aren't served within the current operational hours of transit. For people when transit ends around 9 o'clock, that's got a huge impact on quality of life. But it's also got a huge impact on employment. If somebody can't get home from work or if they have to spend the equivalent of an hour plus salary getting home from work, that's a huge economic challenge to them. And it's also a huge economic challenge to employers in our community who I know some have identified this as being a challenge with recruitment. I also think that keeping young people in our community is a high priority of this council. And with less and less high school kids graduating with driver's licenses, if they can't use transit to get to work, but also to get social activities, that makes them a lot less likely to stay in Grand Prairie. So for me, I really feel that we need to be increasing operational hours. That being said, I think that there's innovative ways that we could perhaps increase operational hours. And I've got, and I think staff who are talking to transit users daily probably have a better idea than I do about exactly how and where transit hours should be increased. So for me, this is putting resources in the budget so that we've got room to expand those hours but then letting the administration do some work to come back with us and explain how they feel that that should be done precisely. So I hope council will support this. All right, that motion is in order. Discussion and debate, Councillor Blackmore. Um, I'm gonna support this motion. And the reasons that I have is that um, transit um, in any of its various forms is provided to look after the most vulnerable people in our community who are otherwise unable to navigate in the same way everyone else is. And um, I know that in other communities where I've lived and other communities where I visited, it's highly unusual for transit to end before midnight. And so I find uh, ending transit here at 9 p.m., which is really uh, for, for many people, not myself obviously, but for many people, uh, when, they're real, when their social life begins and we're sending them uh, home or leaving them um, uh, in places where they cannot get home. Uh, so for that reason, because we're, we're not providing transit service as a Cadillac service in Grand Prairie, it's not meant to uh, move uh, people who, who are not vulnerable. It's meant to protect people who are vulnerable. I think we need to look at that in a more uh, um, encompassing way. Um, also, I, I would ask administration to consider those nights of the year where we might want to use transit to encourage people to uh, take transit rather than drive, specifically New Year's Eve, for example. Uh, it's not uncommon in other communities for transit to run till 3 a.m. on those days, and they're certainly not doing it to make money. They're doing it to protect their citizens. So I think we need to look at that in a more holistic way, and therefore I am supporting this motion even though I don't necessarily agree with the dollar figure attached. Councillor Thiessen. Yeah, thank you very much, Mayor Clayton, and thanks for your comments, uh, Councillor Blackmore, and for the motion, Councillor Bressy. Uh, I'm in support of the motion, um, and for a lot, lot of the reasons that have already been mentioned, but uh, just to reiterate some of them, uh, this, this, the time where people I hear more and more frequently that they can't get home from work, they can't, they can't get get to their social obligations or their recreation. They're, they're not able to recreate as, as well as they would in the late night hours. Um, I guess um, I, I do have a question, and I know I'm sort of repeating it, but this wasn't recorded from earlier. Um, but Councillor Bressy, administration, uh, when you asked this question earlier in our budget proceedings, they came up with a number, I believe it was 72, 73,000 around there uh, for one extra position to accommodate these hours. I know that our administration is working on innovative solutions to extend the transit service into later night. 
Uh, so why 100000 rather than what the administration thought it would cost? Rusty? Yeah, thank you, Councilor Thiessen. I know when I asked the administration the cost of expanding hours, that was a very specific, hey, if we expanded by three hours, what would that look like? But as administration digs into this work, they might uh, realize from concerns they've heard from residents, talks to residents, that maybe we need to expand it further, which would require more than $73,000, or maybe it doesn't need to be expanded this much every day of the week, which would meet, or maybe there's a new innovative way to do it that would require less. So. I think at this point we don't know exactly where it should be expanded or how much would. So honestly, a hundred thousand is kind of arbitrary, but it's also about how much money I'd like to spend at this point to to expand it. So it, it's a bit of an estimate on it. But I would highlight that the timeline I've put on this motion would mean that if it passes, a report would come to council prior to us passing our mill rate bylaw. So if it's not quite enough, or alternatively if it's too much, we can make those adjustments to our budget prior to actually issuing a tax levy. Okay, fair enough. And I guess with the rising cost of gas and other other essential goods, uh, at least for gas for the transit or the diesel, uh, this might be an extra expense that we get. And uh, just a comment on what Councillor Blackmore mentioned earlier. We do have a, a good history over the last few years of offering that transit service, like on New Year's and on sometimes Canada Days. And even when we did a 100th anniversary, we had a transit service running for people for the whole weekend. So if this helps that and to make that more common, rather than one-offs here and there. I think that's great. So thanks for bringing that up, Councillor Blackmore. Mayor O'Connor. Thank you, Mayor Clayton. Uh, I will also be supporting this motion as Councillor Bressy has expressed, and I've had a number of calls from residents who are unable to get home from work and have had to take uh, different modes of transportation. And uh, I think it's important that we get our citizens around our city and to functions. There is a lot of events after hours like theater that some of our uh, disabled community are not able to get to and uh, their volunteer life is now restricted uh, to uh, uh, fine hours and they can't go to those events. So I will be supporting this motion. Councillor Plot. Uh, thanks, Mayor Clayton. Um, I'm generally in support of the motion. I am wondering, though, if administration, I guess if this is coming back in Q1, if in Q3 they could bring it back, report of the utilization of it. Um, I know we're all empathetic that we think it's going to get used. I guess my concern would be, what if it doesn't get used, and then we've got another $100,000 in a transit that isn't being allocated properly at that point? So I'm in support of the motion today. I guess I just would look for administration at some point to come back and show that it's actually being subscribed and people are using it. from administration. Um, Councillor Bosch. Thank you, Mayor Clayton. Uh, for me, absolutely, I, it's not okay that people don't have the transit system available, available to them when they need it, especially for work. My question is, though, um, this transit redesign in particular is being run through the month of November for more testing and more um, identifying issues. I'm a little surprised that this already wouldn't be top of mind of of our transit director um, and and the city. Like this is not the professionals in in this capacity of of transit. So I guess I'm wondering if we're a little bit too soon in regards to putting money to different issues. Like what if other issues come up? within the month of November or December that we find out, oh, something isn't working and we need more money for it. I'm wondering, do we wait to see what the issues are um, first and then not like nickel and dime every every concern that comes up and address what the problem is once we know all the answers? Sir Lemieux. Thank you for that question and thank you, Mayor Clayton. Um, I think that, uh, we have a pretty good idea. We have a very good idea of what the issues are. And the issues are going to be addressed uh, starting on November 26th when we make the changes. And those, there's a report coming to uh, committee to explain what those changes are. Uh, we're doing that within a funding envelope that remains consistent. Now, if we want to extend the service, there will, there will be an additional uh, cost. And uh, so, the proposed changes that are being implemented on November 26th do not include extended hours. That would be outside of our funding envelope. Okay, but every concern that you 
you know, potentially can identify has already been figured out. That's you're thinking. correct, and we'll be speaking to those at the committee meeting, yes. Perfect. Okay. Then I don't have any trouble adding to this. Thank you. I'm uh, just going to jump in the queue here. Um, I had a question in regards to, I, I support the opportunity for the change to the service because I do believe, especially in retail, that there are many people that are looking to use that form of transportation to get home after work. Um, I guess uh, in the current operational model, Mr. Lemieux, is there consider consideration given to start slightly later? I'm, I'm, I'm surprised and don't know the numbers of how many people catch trans transit at 5.55 a.m., knowing that typically students and hospitality workers and, and um, retail are the traditional users. I know there are some individuals from other sectors that may be using the bus. I'm just a little surprised to see that it warrants starting that early. So is there any data that we can um, be provided potentially in that update in the first quarter that would support um, that early start? Yeah, thank you for the question, um, Madam Mayor. We will certainly ask our uh, transit director to address that when he comes to committee on Great. November 22nd. Thank you. Councillor O'Toole? Yes, I uh, have the same concerns as everybody else around the table. Uh, I know a business in the area next to Rona. Uh, there's young people there that cannot work the late shifts because they can't get to work or get home. Uh, you've got the Walmart there. You've got all the fast food businesses in there. It's really hard to get employees. And if you're making it available where they're not being able to get to work, it's just that much tougher. And I know uh, married to a lady that runs a business there, and uh, it's very difficult to put people in shifts that they just can't get to work. So, and get home. And so with that, uh, I'm supportive of this, but I'm very, I'm looking forward to seeing that the new changes are. And, uh, but I'd also still like to support extending the hours till at least 10.30, 11 o'clock for sure. Thank you. I'm gonna close the discussion as uh, I think we're ready to go. Opportunity to close for Council Bressy. Great, thank you. Definitely um, appreciate the conversation. And to, just to address a couple things that got said, I think that um, I definitely do support, as Mayor Clayton said, looking at the early morning hours. Are we getting bang for the buck there? So I don't think that doing a study of that and suggesting, hey, we can make more late late hours by getting rid of some early morning hours might, were, might be worthy of conversation. I'd also note that the reason I'm bringing this up now, I've long felt that transit hours should be expanded. But when we were just on a conventional system, I got why I didn't think that was palatable to council. And I don't even know how palatable it was to me because the idea of putting around mostly empty conventional route buses because a few dozen people have to get home, that's not appetizing to me for a bang for buck. But I think with the new on demand, I'm interested to see what administration brings forward with ways to do this. Also, just uh, one caution I'd give to the idea of bringing back utilization numbers in quarter three of next year. I definitely am all for that, but also. I'd point out that if if this motion carries and if council does make changes, that would probably mean that they don't happen until quarter two. So if we had numbers brought in brought back at the end of quarter three, they'd only reflect usage in summer months where daylight lasts a long time and it's warm out. And I would expect that usage in winter months would be better than summer months. So definitely should still get those utilization numbers, but just caution council, let's if we do expand hours, let's give it a full year to see utilization before we make any conclusions about how well regarded that is in the community. Council Bressy's closed. Call the question. Great. Thank you for that. If I don't see anyone else in the queue for any potential uh, discussion or debate on transit, we will now move to invest GP. I will start. Oh, I apologize. Sorry. Now we're good. Let's see how that vote did before I move on. Uh, that was carried unanimously. Now, I will see if there's anyone else for transit discussion or debate. Seeing none, we'll move to invest GP, and I'll go slow in case you wanna get in the queue. First item of consideration, economic development. Second item of consideration, events and entertainment. Third item consideration, inspections. Fourth 
item of consideration, investment attraction. Councillor Thiessen. Yeah, thank you very much, Mayor Clayton. Uh, I agree, like, in, as far as InvestGP goes, uh, we, we do need to, to attract businesses and people to our community. Uh, I, I guess maybe I just missed it in our overview and in our booklet, so I was just looking for a little more info on what this budget line item would entail. Sure. I will uh, defer to CAO Nicolay, who is the Acting Chief of Investment. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And just clarification, the item for investment attraction? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. It would be a, a number of things. Generally, it's what would be referred to in the private sector as business development. So getting out, talking to people that may be interested in, in uh, relocating their businesses or industry into the Grand Prairie area. Uh, that takes a concerted effort, working with investors, working with sources of capital, working with markets to try to determine what would do well here and what wouldn't. So this, by uh, establishing a specific investment attraction area to complement the brood, the business retention, expansion, and workforce development, you end up with a full economic development package that should be effective. Hey, no, thank you for that, Mr. City Manager. I agree. Uh, I think uh, you need to spend money sometimes to make money, and you need to put in resources to, to get that development in. So I think this is a worthy line item. But thanks for the information. All right. Councillor Berg. Thank you, Mayor Clayton. Mine's around uh, events and entertainments, and I was kind of making an assumption, and I thought maybe I shouldn't, so I'll just ask for clarity. With events and entertainment, is that the budget for Invest Grand Prairie to attend different events and entertain, or is this something that would include Experience Grand Prairie and other events like that? Mr. Nicolay. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Door number two. It, it is two. Okay, thank you. Your host. <laughs> Seeing no business arising, planning and development. Oh, sorry, Councillor O'Toole. Are you in planning development or back in invest attraction? Investment and attraction? Yes. Okay, go And it me. regards the large uh, scale tourism. Is that was going to fit into this? Nope. Okay, that's why I was holding off. Uh, it, it's in SDWC. Okay, thank you. I'll bring it up then. No problem. We've passed that. Well, that sucks. <laughs> I will do, for those of you who may be not as quick on the finger as you should be, I will give an opportunity at the end, just in case. All right. Um, I am on planning and development, and I see Councillor Blackmore. Councillor Blackmore's button's been pushed for a little while. <laughs> Join the club, my friend. Um, I just, uh, I want, uh, I would like the city manager to tell me uh, how, I see a lot of um, um, similarity between sport development, wellness culture, and running uh, sport tourism. Uh, I see a lot of a commonality with uh, events and entertainment. And I'm wondering what the process will be for them to support each other in their goals and in their events. Um, maybe I don't necessarily want them to be separated into two different buckets, uh, but if they can work together and be uh, effective, I would be okay with that. Mr. Nicolay. Thank you, Madam Chair. And a really good question, and this is a work in progress, but the issue of where you see separation and need for separation in some instances and consolidation in others, I see organizational opportunity. So what we see right now in the box and wire diagram that is the organizational chart and what's manifest in these specific budgets is the current image as to how the organization should work together. That will be refined over 2023 in detail in order to try to get at some of those efficiencies and efficacy uh, items that you're identifying. Okay, because both sport tourism and event tourism are uh, economic drivers for a community. So I, I just want to make sure that we're not um, building opposition right. and more collaboration. I can absolutely assure you through the chair that that is the objective of the new organization. All right. So, last call. 
SGP. Hang on. I will now double check because I understand one of my colleagues has missed something. So, Councillor O'Toole, you had something you wanted to address. Yes, I was just wondering if we could have a little discussion regarding the uh, uh, large scale tourism funding. Uh, we had it at $400,000 a few years ago. We drew it back. Two. Two? It was never more than two. Okay, well, I'm really. Okay. It was $200,000. We cut it in half, and uh, then we had COVID. And, uh, and then a couple of concerns I got is. The, the the announcement of when the funding gets awarded, if they could move it back, so there are times to use that money and save money that they might get in bringing acts in or getting bids out. The other question is: Is there an, does interest in increasing that uh, funding back up to uh, a number that can really? genuinely supports some events in the in the city and uh, I would like to see it go up to at least two hundred thousand uh, dollars I'd be willing to go maybe even a little bit more but COVID is over people want to get things done and they want to be out and uh, it allows for more things to possibly take place because of lack of funding and so with that I'll okay so first Question, Mr. Lemieux or Mr. Miller, is there consideration in that funding to um, look at multiple dates of application or changing the date of application? I'll, Mr. Miller. Thanks, Mayor Clayton. Uh, I think that's something we could certainly look at if we uh, if there was excess funding. I think right now we're set at 100,000. There's usually enough interest for one intake, but if there was uh, multiple dates and, and an increased level, we could uh, consider other options. Just a reminder to those, the, there is very specific criteria for large-scale tourism. This isn't local community events. This is intended to create tourism for an identified kilometer radius. You need to travel from out of town, the bulk of the attendees, et cetera. So there is criteria. This isn't for having a local event. This is intended to be a tourism driver. Uh, I have a number of people in the queue. Councillor Thiessen. So I guess, sorry, before we get that, I'm not going to just go around people's feelings as much as I care about your feelings. Um, can I get a motion on the floor for discussion, Councillor O'Toole? I'd like to make a motion to increase the pot for uh, large-scale tourism to $200,000. All right. Now I'll go to the queue, Councillor Thiessen. Uh, thank you very much, Mayor Clayton. Uh, I'm really happy to hear this motion come forward from Councillor O'Toole. This has been... Uh, this has been something I've been talking about since the last election and how we get out of COVID and how we build up our community spirit. Um, I wasn't sure I was going to bring it up today because I had a text exchange with the mayor and I was like, well, I can see your point. Um, and, but to hear that this is coming up and I'm not alone in the, in the wish to maybe increase that funding, the way I look at it coming out of COVID and most likely if I'm looking in my crystal ball, um, I'm going to see at least two events that are probably going to apply for large scale tourism funding and they're probably going to apply to the max of $50,000. That would be the Grand Prairie Stompede and likely the Bear Creek Folk Festival. That's, that's not including the East Coast Garden Party who applied last year, as well as a fastball pitch that applied last year for a big junior girls fastball tournament. Um, just this last week, we saw a member from our cricket community club looking as part of his ask for $15,000 to host an event that would be probably at least province-wide, you know, bringing people into the cricket pitch. And it got me thinking, well, we got lots of field space. They don't necessarily have to do it on their own cricket field. But if they wanted to start that and create a large-scale tourism funding, uh, then they could create that event through this. But the way I saw it is, is if we keep the, the level of the tourism funding at $100,000, we're actually cutting out the opportunity for events to become mainstream in our community. And I'll, I'll mention one, Buck Wild, which the PBR is now full stream in the community. They no longer require large scale tourism funding, but they got their start in Grand Prairie through that $50,000 ask years ago. And now it looks like they're gonna be a staple in our community for a long time, which is exactly why this fund was created, uh, is to give opportunities to people who had events that would draw people to this community uh, tourism dollars, uh, culture-wise, sports-wise, 
uh, it's it's just great. Now, I know that maybe perhaps some some around the table might say, well, we have a strategic fund that we could maybe use for other events, but I don't think that's necessarily how we should use our strategic funds. You know, ch like chipping away at it, fifteen thousand here, fifty thousand there. That's at least not how I want to want to use that fund. So I think Councillor O'Toole's ask is very in alignment with my ask um, because I'd hate to say no to the events. We have legacy events who are going to ask this year, um, and they're likely going to get my vote uh, because of what they already do for the community. you know. And it doesn't necessarily have to be music events, but I look at the development of our athletes and the development of our artists. And it's because of events like the Stompede and the Bear Creek Folk Festival, why our artists have been able to get out into the larger world such as Tennille Towns or Brad Mates from Emerson Drive. That was a lot of their big push in the beginning came from the Stompede, which is a sporting event, but they also have a music and culture aspect to it as well. Or look at the Kaylee Cardinals, our Indigenous Artist of the Year, you know, who got her big exposure break through the Bear Creek Folk Festival. So I would hate to weigh events that are trying to find legs, like the PBR, because we don't have enough funding. And I'd hate to also not grant the legacy events that keep driving people into our community year over year over year, get that pot, which is so well deserved for them when they when they ask for it. I know it's not supposed to be perpetual, but I really think this fund is was originally designed to give new events legs to draw people into our community and it's done that. It's also here to support the events that are legacies in our community. So I'm fully 100% in support of this and I hope uh, other members of council see the reasoning and the rationale behind this. Thank you, Kevin O'Toole. Councillor Blackmore. Yeah, so everybody knows I have a full queue. So um, I just, just have a question for administration. Uh, currently, the pot sits at 100,000 uh, and we have an intake date. Um, are we receiving more applications than we have funds available for? Thank you, uh, Mayor Clayton. So currently the budget is at $100,000 and the deadline is February 1st for applications. And uh, we tend to be uh, fully subscribed only one year recently where the funds were undersubscribed, but that may have been due to COVID. Um, okay, but do we receive more applications than we have funding available for? Like, are we turning people away because we don't have funding available um, to meet their needs? I don't have that answer, but I'll get that answer for you. Mr. Miller? Thanks, Mayor Clayton. Uh, if my memory serves me right, we are uh, we don't fund everybody that has asked. We uh, we rank them and uh, and then recommend. But uh, there's additional there's asks beyond what we have funding for. Is my uh, memory? Thank you. That's what I need to know. Question: Your memory. Those people had other opportunities for funding. There wasn't an event that came to Grand Prairie that we didn't support in some level. Uh, I think that's probably correct. Yeah. Yes. Okay. And some we funded in the past, right. so we we tried to encourage new opportunities as well, or new. Uh, so new I, I guess if we're funding them, if we're finding funds for them in other places, and this is where they should be getting funds from, then it would make, in my mind, make sense to increase this pot rather than sending them to uh, other nickel and dime corners of the budget. Councillor Palat. Thanks, Mayor Clayton. Just if memory serves me correct, I thought we did a review of this last year, and I'm not on opposed to the motion. I just want to get some information on it, but I thought we defunded it because it wasn't getting subscribed. I thought it was at 200,000, and, uh, and last term in council, we went through a, this at a committee level, and I come to council saying, let's defund this because it wasn't getting subscribed. So can somebody for administration, was I, did I, am I wrong on that, or was that? Mr. Miller? It was pre-COVID, though, that we were already talking about defunding it, that it wasn't getting fully prescribed. Um, so while administration's looking that up, uh, my, my other comment on it is I also don't know if it's our obligation to continually fund the same events over and over. Love both the events we fund every year, but I don't think this was set up originally, in my opinion, was set up to be seed money forever. So the Stompede and the Bear Creek Folk Festival are very successful events. Yes, they're great for our region. They're usually profitable now, and they are businesses in their own way. So I, there is a point for me where I don't know if I really think we need to keep funding the same events to the same level. So I do wondering if it, it backed up when I said no the other night, maybe there's a point we have to be realistic and say, sorry, Stompede, you only get 25. Sorry, Bear Creek, you only get 25. Um, 
they're great events in the community. And, I'm, and again, I'm not even saying I'm uh, fundamentally opposed to this. I just don't know if it's our job to keep propping up the same events and then try to get new ones. If, if this is about getting large scale tourism events, then let's attract new ones. Th those ones are successful in our community now, and that's what's taking our funding. So I have a little bit of concern with that. And I'm not sure if administrations had a chance to find out if I was right or wrong on that defunding it. Miller, do you happen to have that information? Uh, I have a little bit more, uh, Mayor Clayton. So uh, Ms. Bieberdorf and uh, Ms. Casually are providing a bit of information here. Uh, so the ones that we did not fund did not meet the criteria last year. And uh, most asked for for more than what we could provide. When we, we have a threshold of 50% as well. So, so we, uh, yeah, that's all the information. And then we did reduce it in uh, 2019 to 100,000 from 200 as one of our uh, Cost saving measures when we were forced to uh, downsize on the budget. Yeah, and, and thanks for that. The reason I, that, that my memory was that as well is the reason we defunded it pre COVID is it wasn't getting subscribed enough. So, as much as I want to believe it'll get subscribed more, I also, it might just be $100,000 that sits in a slush line like it did lots of years before that just went back into general revenues. Um, so, I'm, I'm a little bit torn on this one because I'm not sure if that's the best use of $100,000 um, at this point. Councillor Bressy. Hey, thank you. I, 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 I definitely uh, think there's going to be some interesting conversations coming up when it comes to allocations. I know personally, I if when I look at legacy versus new events, if this funding is the difference between a, a legacy event staying solvent and awesome or potentially being in danger, I'd personally rather support an event we know works for our community and does good things than a brand new than take a risk on a brand new event, but I totally get the other side too. So it's going to be interesting conversations come allocation time. I think those conversations are going to be very challenging at a funding envelope of only $100,000, especially if I recall correctly, we had two of our big legacy events didn't have to apply for funding this time around because they carried it over from previous years when they saved it from COVID. Um, I definitely support this motion in principle. My concern though, because I think $200,000 a year is a reasonable spend on big events like this. My concern is when I look at the capital budget, we're also going to be debating potentially $400,000 for the Alberta Summer Games, and that would be $600,000 on large events. And I think that's probably getting beyond my comfort level. Um, I'm curious, a question for administration is, if council did want to put $200,000 on towards this bucket, is there any reason that when that we couldn't later when we're debating the allocation of large scale, scale tourism events, put a portion of that towards our municipal contribution for the Alberta Summer Games? Say that again. So if we have $200,000 set aside for large scale tourism events, um, is there a reason, could we allocate some of that towards the Alberta Games municipal contribution? Is there any reason we couldn't do that if we chose to? I get, I, I'll refer to CFO Whiteway. She's nodding no, but I guess then it would be the host committee applying to the large scale tourism fund for a portion of their municipal contribution. Correct? Yeah. yeah. Or kind of where I'm going with that is maybe it's just council just says flat out there's only $100,000 for other organizations here because $100,000 is going to the Alberta Municipal Games, but we still got $200,000 built into our budget. So therefore there's um, we're still spending $200,000 a year. Just sorry, this one event that council prioritizes is taking up half of it this year, but it won't next year. Just out of curiosity, I don't see the value and the expected municipal contribution is $400,000. So you would in perpetuity put $200,000. So for one year, 100 of it would go to the games. Yeah. 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 All right, uh, Council Berg. Thank you, Mayor Clayton. So one event that we did fund for $50,000 that hasn't been brought up is Grand Con when it came. And so somehow we found some money for that, but I, if I'm correct, Ms. Whiteway, uh, that was funded through unapplied for money that from before, but somehow, some way we found $50,000 for them. For Grand Con. Do you remember the funding, where the funding for Grand Con came from? Okay, we'll get back to you. Yeah, so if we've already got, say, Stompede on the table and Bear Creek, and then we've got Grand Con, which was a huge success. Now we're, uh, yeah, in East Coast as well. Uh, we could run into some, some issues there. Now, one of the things, uh, circling back to uh, Councillor Palat's point, 
The Alberta Foundation for the Arts does fund a number of these events to help get them launched, but they work on a scale. And I'm, I'm just going to pull numbers out of the air, but say it's $50,000. Year one, you get $50,000. Year two, you get 40, 30, 20, 10. And then after five years, the money runs out. And basically it's, it's funding to help you build an audience and build sponsors. And the determination there is if you haven't made it viable within five years, it collapses. And we've seen that across the province where we see an event for two, three, four years and uh, or five. And then after that, it disappears. And typically it's because they didn't build that viable business. So um, to Councillor Palat's point, that model already exists of, of decreasing funds as the event goes on. Councillor O'Connor. Thank you, Mayor Clayton. Um, I just want uh, uh, to point out a couple of things that because of COVID that changed the game for everyone. And, and it's only now the Bear Creek Oak Festival has finally got to a break even. So they're not a successful business yet. So uh, I would think that uh, we should break this into different levels for different kinds of events. Right now, I hear it's 50,000 is the minimum, but perhaps that, you know, it should be tiered to match whatever applications are coming for. And just mention the Comic Con, uh, uh, these things should be promoted so it attracts business and attracts people into the community. So I think we should look at part of it should be a legacy piece where we're putting money aside for these larger events. They're always going to come. And, uh, and speaking about curling and, and uh, other events. So I think it's important that we uh, look at how many can we support to get them off the ground and then tier it. So I'm not sure. And my question to administration is, is uh, if the asks are minimum 50,000 or is it very? For the mute, Mr. Miller. Uh, thanks, Mayor Clayton. I'm just uh, my recollection is uh, some come in lower, some come in higher. But, uh, yeah, and there's specific criteria as well that we ask for to be uh, to to meet that. But council can always uh, adjust the criteria too, and, and they have done that in the past. So just to clarify that, and I know Ms. Whiteway had a comment on a previous question. The intent, and it's right online, of the large scale tourism fund was. Uh, it's considered annually. The dates of submission were by February 1st. The intent was to grow tourism with a drop of 100 kilometers or greater, spending at least 30, uh, resulting in at least 35% of the attendance by visitors to our community, uh, and that the intended audience was to be greater than 2,000 people per day. So it's an event that's intended to be 2,000 people a day, per day, over 100 kilometers. Um, and 35% of, uh, of the attendance by visitors to our community. Uh, Ms. Whiteway, you had an answer to a previous question. Uh, yes, thank you, Mayor Clayton. So just back to uh, Councillor Burke's question. So Grand Con was funded 50,000 from large scale tourism uh, this year. The other 50,000 went to East Coast Garden Party, just for information. That's 150-50. From this year's 100,000, 50 went to Grand Con, 50. I'm just going to jump in the queue because everyone else is on round two. Um, I don't support this motion. I am a huge advocate for tourism. On any single day, though, if you're going to do an event that draws 2,000 people a day from a large radius of 100 kilometers or greater with the intent of growing visitors to our community, a, you're not doing this with a couple months notice. So February 1st is a realistic timeline. You're not just going to, in July, say, hey, I'm going to have an event in October and be able to be successful in an event that, that meets our criteria. Question for Mr. Manuel, though, before I, or Mr. Miller, before I finish. Do we go back and check that they actually did 2,000 people a day, that they actually had 35% of their people as visitors? What sort of um, assessment do we do following the money we hand out? Uh, thanks, Mayor Clayton. Uh, I think I'm just getting a message here on that. No worries. Okay. Uh, thanks again here. We, uh, the process is they report back to us on the attendance numbers, and we don't have people counters at the right. sites, but we just rely on the, what they provide back so to us. So they provide data that 
that appears that they have meet the yes. criteria so that next year they qualify. Yes, okay. correct. So um, I'm all for seed money for tourism. I'm all for supporting uh, people coming to our community. Any single day I will fight for something that grows people to be more aware of the um, the amenities, the attributes, the values of Grand Prairie. But I do think that organizations can plan for success when they know that our funding is, is limited, intended to be seed money. I don't think that many of these events that have been legacy events are unaware of our expectations. I do think that they rely sometimes too much on this funding. I think that if there are new events that are looking to come to our community, absolutely they should apply. I know through Travel Alberta funding, um, if you're looking for co-op marketing funding, after five years you're not eligible. So I know that there are many um, other organizations that grant and fund money that have stronger criteria than we do. And I think that um, sport tourism, event tourism, all of it is extremely valuable, but we do corporate events, we do paid events, we do sport events, we now you know, we're $100,000 for large scale tourism events. At some point, if the community doesn't support these events, why are we supporting the money? So if we're gonna to continue to hand out money to make these events viable, that's not a good use of our money in my opinion. If the events are viable and we wanna get them off the ground to, to get them going, fair enough. But we can't be the funders to drag along these events just because they've existed for 10 years. If the events after five years aren't viable, then there's obviously not enough interest in that event. So I'm comfortable with the $100,000. I'm also comfortable if somebody came in March, decided they want to have an event in December, and they thought they would have qualified for large-scale tourism, and council believes in that event, then we take $100,000 from our council strategic initiative. I don't want to nickel and dime it away at $10,000 a piece. I get that. But a $100,000 contribution to an event because we think it's going to be of the magnitude of a game such as the Alberta Winter Games. If you didn't read in the news, the Canada Winter Games is not does not have a, a home. I know that the city of Red Deer put $8 million into that, but they the significant legacy piece from that game definitely justified the $8 million. So there are many decisions to be made, but $100,000, in my opinion, is a great amount of money that the community could use. The Bear Creek Folk Fest, for example, is getting great legs. I think that you know, if, if their funding went less this year, they will survive because the community loves that event. Not because council supported that event, because the community loves that event. So I think that I won't support the motion, although I love this fund and I think that there are great um, other events on the radar, but it doesn't mean that they have to be on the back of all taxpayers. Councillor Blackmore. Um, I agree with what Mayor Clayton has said 100%. I was sitting here thinking, you know, uh, Stompede has been in uh, operating in Grand Prairie since the 70s. Um, maybe even before then, if you look at uh, the, the county fair. And there's been many, many years of which they have had enough funds to give money away. And so if they are suddenly in a position where we are giving them money to keep them up and running, I, I'm thinking to myself that they need to have been better managers of their legacy funding to start with. And so um, while I did think, well, maybe I would be willing to make a, an amendment to the motion to reduce it to $50,000, I find that I am uh, not in favor of that either. So I am simply going to vote on the motion as it comes forward. Uh, probably uh, in an opposition. Councillor Thiessen. Uh, thank you very much, Mayor Clayton. I I actually agree with you. I, I wrote it down word for word. I also believe this is a great amount of money the community can use. Now, of course, I believe in it for different reasons. Um, the extra hundred thousand dollars, as we've already discussed, you know, uh, at a fifty thousand dollar maximum for each event. Is going to cover four events, maybe only three events if we do this, and then have fifty thousand dollars room for for any new events that might creep through the cracks that we weren't aware of at the start of the year. Um, I don't disagree with Mayor Clayton that an event, as a former event promoter myself, can pull itself together in a large scale tourism fund, uh, put together an application, and be ready to roll by February first to put that in there and have a successful event. 
which is why I especially like the motion that was present, presented by Councillor O'Toole to change the criteria by adding a second deadline. Because what that does is it frees up that time and that space for event organizers to plan out their event properly. If they don't meet the February 1st deadline, they can go to an October 1st deadline perhaps, figure out what they're gonna do and then start their promotion that way. And there's a kit of money available for them. Now this isn't just to fill up our summer season. And this isn't just to do arts and culture events. This is to do any event. In fact, what if we did have a cricket tournament that was playing at the CKC fields? I mean, I'm sure we could retrofit that relatively easily for them and then they'd have grandstands for people to come and sit in. They could help out our hotel rooms and all that other stuff. So I think this is a very thoughtful motion by Councillor O'Toole, not to just wantonly throw away $100,000 for events. And who's saying that they're all getting the max too? What if we have eight events that come in and then we still have to determine like who's getting less funding, who's getting more funding. I do agree that this, uh, this fund was never intended to be perpetually granted out to the same organizations. But I'll just reiterate what was already spoken before, both the Stompede and the Bear Creek Folk Festival who have benefited from this fund did take time off and the Bear Creek Folk Festival, especially over two years, uh, didn't have an event and carried that over. I know lots of promoters who might've just taken that money and ran and they showed that they were big community players and they took their pause. And very much so as someone who used to write grants to the Alberta Foundation for the Arts, um, after that five years, you are supposed to take a one year pause and then you're eligible to apply again for future events. So um, I believe that our legacy events have taken their pauses over this. And I believe that $100,000 is a small ass and a great amount of money that the community can and will likely use if we put it there. If we don't, then we're, we're stuck debating whether or not we have high priorities on maybe building lift stations with our strategic funds to get development spurred on or to support $100,000 for an event. And that could be great, but at the same time, like what's stopping anyone who might apply for large scale tourism at a $50,000 maximum from just coming to council and appealing for a strategic fund initiative. So um, when they can get more money that way. So I like to keep it streamlined this way. I like to promote more events. And the more that we can do to bring our community together and keep people connected, I think is exactly what council and this organization should be working towards. And I think this is a small investment with a great return on that investment, uh, especially if we pull together four events throughout the year and we have seasonal events. Maybe we have eight events. I don't know. There's lots of possibilities, but they shrink the, sm the smaller the pot is. So that's my appeal. Thank you. Councillor Bosch. Thank you, Mayor Clayton. Uh, this is for administration. Uh, for the $400,000 for the Winter Games, what financial bucket is that coming out of? Currently, it's coded as Council Strategic Initiative. Okay, thank you. Just giving you a break. Councillor Berg. Thank you, Mayor Clayton. Um, so speaking to uh, Councillor O'Toole's deadline of February 1st and pushing it back, uh, one of the things when I, I worked in broadcasting, I was working with a number of events, it was a common concern slash complaint of a February 1st deadline because it was, as, as Councillor Thiessen pointed out, oftentimes too late. Uh, you've got your talent booked or you've got part of your uh, event already planned. And so there's a, there's a gap in the planning. So um, for me personally, I still am happy with one deadline, but maybe that event is November 1st. And so then that way, going into the Christmas season, they know what funding they have to promote that event. So um, that's just, again, from experience, talking to different promoters over a handful of years, an event uh, deadline, I guess, for, for these grants to know would be prior to Christmas as they promote uh, the upcoming summer season for tickets. I'll turn it to Councillor O'Toole to close. I just had one quick question for Mr. Miller. Um, has there been any events that we've funded that um, when they come back with their reporting measurements that um, we're concerned that they potentially wouldn't have qualified? I think of events that potentially say, yeah, we're gonna get 2,000 people a day and, and we're gonna draw from this and, and then they, they don't and we haven't checked it. Um, have, have we ever had considerations or concerns about the, the measurement and the data coming back? Thanks, Mayor Clayton. Not in my uh, recollection, but uh, I think thinking about PBR with 
during COVID, we might have been under the numbers there, but it was uh, exceptional circumstances. But I guess you could give free tickets and say that your event is 3,000 people a day. So. Right, yes. But other than that, I think we always did debrief a bit, and, uh, and they were all always successful and met the criteria. Right, okay. Councillor O'Toole to close. Yeah, I'm, uh, my, my ask was to increase it, and I agree with pretty much everything that you said, Mayor Clayton. Um, one of the things that uh, was missed was this event, once issued the funding, it must go on, whether the weather is bad or good or whatever, too hot, too cold. Um, so that's, we spent a lot of time come up, coming up with that criteria when it was initially made. And uh, I would like in the future meeting to review the process again and maybe fine tune it. I don't think this is the, the time or the place to discuss it. It was just a matter of funding for today. And in the future, I will possibly bring up a motion to review the large scale tourism. All right, that's a called question on this motion. My e scribe's not connected, so um, I vote in opposition. O'Connor votes in favor. Bressy, how do you vote? Bressy opposed. Five to four. So moving on, and there's no, just last call, no one else had um, items they may have missed. So we are going to, catch, correct me if I'm wrong, anybody, but to my knowledge, we are gonna move on to capital projects. Correct, Ms. Whiteway? Um, thank you, Mary Clayton. I, just to clarify, I thought maybe there was some questions on debt or on fiscal services at all. Okay. If we wanted to. See if, yeah, I'm, I'm comfortable. I think everybody understood page 94 and 95 shows our debt balance over 15 years decreasing significantly. I don't think, um, I think we're good there. I see Councillor Bressy in the queue though. Great. I think I know the answer to this, but I just want to make sure. Um, we had we had an open line of credit for downtown rehabilitation. Has that been closed and it's fully fixed at now? Ms. Whiteway? Uh, thank you, Mary Clayton. Yes, correct. Great. Thank you. All right. Councillor Berg. So the only point that I see in, in uh, this is that over this next four-year budget, there are no plans on any major or significant builds or projects. Whiteway? Uh, thank you, Mayor Clayton. So there, there is uh, one proposed venture uh, project in capital. So when we do go through, um, you'll notice the Clean Energy Improvement Program is one of that is marked as for borrowing. Uh, the other that we sometimes go, if we end up buying land for any reason, that's one that we may also come to council throughout, but it's unknown at this time. I think there's a budget line of a million dollars per year in there. That's right. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so um, Ms. Whiteway, uh, we're going to look to you for an introduction to budget or to capital budget discussion. And following that, we're gonna have a quick in-camera regarding some contractual obligations. Okay, um, thank you, Mayor Clayton. And when, or would the preference be to now maybe um, look at the budget operating deferrals, the referrals in operating? Oh, you're right, I missed those. My apologies. So, um, if somebody can put them on the screen for me because they're not in our book, um, the budget referrals. Um, I know we started with Broadleaf Weed Control. There is the items there as well as the $18,000 Top up uh, for operating requests from Nighthawk, 1800. My apologies. Um, uh, Councillor Palat is in the queue. Uh, and we're going to go starting in order. So, first one, broadleaf control, weekly mowing along arterial corridors. No comments on that. Uh, so, Councillor Brett Blackmore, sorry. One such. She's in the queue first, sorry. Sure. Go ahead, Councillor Blackmore. Well, I'm not opposed to increased mowing on arterial corridors. I would like to offset that 
with a reduction of mowing in, uh, let's call it the back corners of the city for lack of a better word. I think there's a lot of areas that we're mowing right now that really do not require the amount of mowing they're getting or mowing at all. Uh, for example, there's uh, quite a wide swath of land that lies between uh, the, the ball diamonds and the creek where we're mowing. It's actually a fairly steep slope. There is really no reason to be mowing that area, in my opinion. It would be better off to let it go to grass. So uh, rather than increasing uh, the financial budget for mowing, I would be happier to see us offset um, increased mowing on arterial corridors with the reduction of mowing in other areas of the city. Okay. Councillor Bressey. Great. Well, first of all, I um, hope we continue to mow holes 2 and 17 of the disc golf course, if that's what Councillor Blackmore's talking about. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but I can see why she might be opposed. Uh, I think you know that I'm not talking about that specific <laughs> corridor. Uh, I've also, uh, so just a process question, Mary Clayton. So I'm assuming none of these are in the budget unless somebody makes a motion. Absolutely. That, okay. that is correct. Thank you. Councillor Plot. Uh, thanks, Mayor Clayton. I wholeheartedly agree with Councillor Blackmore. I just, as I drive around our community, I, I love the, the green corridors, but I don't know why we need to mow them when we're never using them. Like, we have a ton of parks, we have a ton of connectivity in the city, but I don't see people using these green spaces as green spaces. So I, I would be very happy if we could ask parks to find a way to, if this was a priority of the council to to, to do the arterial corridors, to find ways that we defund under areas that we're mowing. I thought we talked about naturalization a lot last term. And I was a big fan of it. I, I thought we could be doing even more naturalization than we're currently doing. Um, so I wouldn't really be in support of, of the spending on this one um, unless we were finding other ways to, to bring it down. I guess it's just a repurposing of funds, but I'm not a, a fan of, of adding more to just mow more. Mr. O'Connor, so I'm looking for business arising unless you have a question for administration. Yeah, I'm just wondering if we go to natural, uh, is there uh, a wildlife issue that could creep up in some of these areas. I like the idea, but I'm just asking administration. Uh, I know that from the park, there have been uh, coyotes and foxes coming up from uh, the park. So I'm just wondering if that would be an issue. Mr. Clavin. Thank you, Mayor Clayton. Uh, I don't think it would likely be a significant issue. Uh, that being said, I think we'd want to consult with our parks department and the community on any way, any areas that we would naturalize. And that's a commitment that was made to council that we wouldn't naturalize any more areas before coming to council with the areas specifically chosen to naturalize. Uh, if it was council's desire, that is a report that we could bring forward that uh, could propose areas that would offset the cost of doing this, that would free up these resources to mow the arterials. Councillor Thiessen, sorry. Sorry, Mayor Clayton, I'm just wondering if there is a motion on the table to, there's not? Okay. Councilor Blackmore. Um, I would happily make the motion though. Um, I would move that uh, the broad leaf weed control weekly mowing service level be maintained, but that the dollar value of 44,854 be offset by reduction of mowing in other areas. So question for administration then, um, I, and I don't recall from our conversations, if council wanted to approve weekly mowing along arterial corridors, um, is there identified areas that could be left naturalized to compensate for that amount that would be required for arterial mowing? Thank you, Mayor Clayton. Um, roughly, um, we'd need to offset it by about 75 hectares. So that would be the amount of land we would have to choose to naturalize or significantly reduce mowing in, in order to uh, free up those resources. So, and just because I know Councillor Plot's new to the conversation, is it possible, do you have a highlight or high level um, recap of the discussion? We talked about what that would look like in arterial mowing and we talked about it Know, being weekly, but then it's staggering off with contracted spraying. It, those two were kind of, those buckets were connected. And I don't know if council maybe recalls all of the conversation that happened on those items. 
Sure. So ultimately, the the discussion stemmed from the amount of broadleaf we have. So dandelion specifically, you know, this year was a significant year for dandelions uh, throughout the city. Uh, we were looking for what methods of control. You know, if there's chemical control, we could spray glyphosate or Roundup, uh, which would kill everything, which is obviously not something we want to do. Um, and uh, versus uh, another um, herbicide that would uh, take care of only dandelions. Uh, and that ultimately the choice was based on uh, a few considerations that we would try both in that, uh, at least through the referral here, that we would try contracted spraying and see if that was effective. And if it was effective, we wouldn't perhaps need to do that again, uh, or we would need another uh, application of it in the future. So it wasn't to spend 20000 every single year on uh, broadleaf weed control, but as necessary. Oh, I'm just going to jump in the queue, Councillor Thiessen. Um, initially, um, I, I really enjoyed the conversation on this. It was a, a desire of mine personally that we pay more attention to our arterial corridors. I believe that as we increase tourism and bring uh, re attract professionals to our community, that there needs to be identified areas that are really um, groomed and beautified. I think that uh, being in a winter city, sometimes our curbs are beat to heck. Um, our, we don't always grow grass well in our medians. We, uh, we have quarters of trees that we're aware of that aren't growing well because of our, because of our weather. We're trying to address beautification um, of our growing uh, of our tr urban forestry and by clustering, we're looking at other options. Um, the discussion stemming from the fact that the arterial corridors, the, the greenery in those areas could be healthier, which would include weekly mowing. Um, to the motion, which is is moving the money, I don't know if there's enough money there for me to, um, if there's enough landscaping for us to pick up that 7,500 hectares. So um, as much as I'm um, very interested in improving the aesthetics of our arterial corridors for many reasons, um, I, I think I'll vote against this motion today um, because I'm optimistic that contracted spraying will help increase the beautification of our arterial corridors. So for now, um, I'll vote against the arterial corridors motion. Councillor Thiessen. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Mayor Clayton. I think it's no surprise that I agree with you on uh, almost everything you said, except for the contracted spraying part. Uh, and so I'll get to that when, when I make a motion later. Um, but as for this, um, as much as I might be the guy that would encourage naturalization, I do like it. Um, one thing that I'm really excited about is our, our urban forest strategy. Uh, now, part of this budget, from my recollection, as is as presented by Mr. DeVries, was this would just be adding a couple part-time staff to the equation to help with the extra mowing, like throughout the throughout the year, and um, and that would help keep the dandelion population down by, by tackling it sooner rather than later so we don't see that big bloom of, of yellow. Um, so I think that was a very well-rationed, well-researched, and, and greatly presented plan to address the mayor's concerns about some of our corridors that are a bit overgrown with uh, the dandelions and broadleaves and stuff like that. Um, I don't want to challenge them to more work to try to find these 75 hectares, much like the mayor said. That's a lot of land to still pick and choose between. And when I think about these extra staff positions, uh, I don't imagine they're going to be mowing the whole time. But if we're employing another strategy, they could be repurposed and put to use in planting trees or otherwise. So um, I'd rather have more hands on deck, especially when we're talking about our bigger priorities, than less hands. So cutting this here, uh, I think, is a bit short-sighted. And that's no knock against the motion maker. Thank you. Right. Any other questions or comments on the motion as presented? Plot. Uh, thanks, Mayor Clayton. I'm just, I guess we're just looking for clarification of level B. So when, when I'm thinking about driving down Resources Road to the east side, it's a natural tree line that we barely mow. To the west side, sorry, yeah, to the west side, it's a berm, which we constantly mow. Is, is that considered a level B, that berm and that whole side that we mow every 10 to 15 days? Mr. Glavin. Thank you, Mayor Clayton. Uh, just getting confirmation uh, that the west side, so the side closest to the development there, and we want Patterson and then Highland Park would be uh, level B. 
So I, I guess for me, this is well I'll go back to naturalization. On one side of the road, we're not doing it. Other side of the road, we're doing it, which is a berm and a hill that nobody ever uses for anything. And so we want to mow that look pretty, but the other side's not done. And I honestly, I've never noticed a difference. And I've never had somebody in our community go, wow, that one side looks great and the other side looks bad. And so I, I do think it's 75 hectares seems like a lot of land, but I, I think when you start looking at boulevards specifically, like when you look down Resources Road, 68th Ave, some of the major corridors, we're mowing berms all the time that never get used. And so I just, I don't understand why we're mowing berms. And so I, I don't think 75 hectares is as far off as we think it is when you consider the land mass that's sitting in some of these berms. So I'm still in support of it because I think it's just, there's a better use of community money than mowing things that are never going to get used. So. I want to be clear that you understand the motion. So the motion would be to naturalize other areas, but mow the arterials. That's my comment is that I think they could find areas of naturalized such okay. as those. Okay, perfect. Councilor Bressy. Great, thank you. Yeah, I'm having trouble I'm having trouble supporting this motion just because I don't know exactly where mowing would get offset. And personally, I don't hear very often people saying, hey, our arterials, um, they're starting to look shaggy and shaggy and um, messy. And I respect that others mm -hmm. might hear that, but I don't hear that a lot. What I do hear a lot is, Hey, that boulevard near my house or that neighborhood park across the street from my house, it's growing daddy lines. I don't really care what's going on in that park, but it's blowing seeds in my yard I've worked very hard for, and that's absolutely driving me crazy. So this is a motion that worries me without having the level of detail I need to support it, so I don't think I can support it today. Councillor Bosch. Thank you, Mayor Clayton. For me, this, basically on the words that, that is listed in front of us, week, weekly mowing, I don't know. Anybody who cuts dandelions knows that they're back in three days. We're looking at minimum of seven. I'm not sure this is the answer to to reducing the dandelions because whether it's in three days or five days, it's still not meeting the weekly mowing um, results that you're looking for. So uh, for me, I, I don't see um, this weekly control working. So whichever way, the Motion is written, I'll vote against it. <laughs> uh, Councillor Blackmore to close. Can I close? Yes, to close, please. Um, 75 hectares is really a drop in the hat when you look at the land base of Grand Prairie. Um, you know, we could not, par not mow uh, the park that's right by my house uh, three times in the summer and you would have accomplished that 75 um, hectares right there. Um, right now it's currently being mowed far more regularly than the grass can actually grow uh, because it's next door to a service building. Um, I really think that we, uh, we need to stop thinking about uh, turf grass as being uh, the answer to all of our aesthetic uh, corridors. Uh, Councillor Pallott referred specifically to Resources Road in the east and west side. The east side is very natural uh, when you get down past 64th Avenue. Uh, and uh, no one ever says it looks ugly or anything. It just looks natural and that's the way it is. I think we need to really consider, uh, particularly in the face of rising gas costs and the rising uh, costs of uh, running machinery, um, we really need to consider that we need to move more towards a naturalized environment and away from uh, continuous mowing. And um, grass gets tall enough, no one will see the dandelions anyway. So I'd really encourage to support this motion that we ask uh, administration to offset the costs of mowing on our corridors with um, letting other areas of the city become more natural or be mowed less often. That was to close. I'll call the question. Councillor Blackmore in favor. Uh, Councillor O'Connor in favor. Opposed. Oh, I'm we're good. Five to four. All right. Next one. Contracted spraying. Um, I warned you. I warned you. 
Um, all right, so we went one way with uh, the broadleaf weed control. I'd like to, to carry on that path with this contracted spring. Now, I understand based off of uh, all the information that we were given that this wasn't something that was being recommended by our administration. Um, I know that many people have issues with the, the dandelions. I sort of sit on the other end, so maybe I'm a bit too biased to be making this motion speaking on it. Uh, but the only time I ever hear people actually complain about the dandelions is in the first two months that their yellow heads start to show. I, I didn't hear one complaint from August on about dandelions in the community. Even though they grow throughout the year, they just, they're just they just not as prevalent. Uh, they're starting to die off at that point. Um, I really thought that the uh, administration had a thoughtful and forward-thinking plan that didn't require spray. And I know that we're going to use mostly non-toxic for this, but it's maybe non-toxic to the turf that's there, but it's not necessarily, as Mr. DeVries stated during that meeting, it's not necessarily met uh, with the same results when we're talking about other, uh, I guess, uh, herbs and trees and other things that are growing around it. So um, I think the, the intention is good. I'm just concerned that the results may be not what were, were intended and un unintended consequences for those. So uh, as much as... Uh, I appreciate uh, this being brought up to address people's concerns with the dandelion population. Um, I just think, hey, we're going to plant more trees. Usually when you plant a tree, it doesn't give those broadleaf weeds the opportunity to grow around them. And if you've ever walked through the, the forest or the woods, you will see an odd dandelion, but you won't see a prevalence of dandelion like fields and fields and fields of them. So I think we are actually addressing this if we move forward with our urban forestry strategy. Uh, and especially if we start looking at those hills, like on Resources Road on the west side, where we always get the big dandelion fields, um, maybe planting a couple trees up top or along the side of the road where it's not impeding a utility corridor. And we might see some of those dandelions lose the, the water to put their root base in because that'll be occupied by trees that we've already planted. So I think there are other methods that we, d we can employ without having to contract spring. It is costly. Sorry, there's no motion on the floor, so are you just... Oh, I just made the motion. I'm speaking to it. What is your motion? Oh, sorry. My apologies. I move to remove the contracted spraying from... Well, there, uh, there's, there, it's not in there. So this is hmm. a motion to bring these forward, and we'll debate on them, and that's it. Yeah, I'm taking taking care of it. I don't want to bring it forward. Oh. Take it off the list. That's not the process. <laughs> Take it Blackmore. off the list. Councilor Blackmore. Okay. 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 I would like to make the motion to include contracted spraying. I believe that people work very hard um, to keep their lawns clean, to keep um, their areas landscaped. And every single year, I get a snow. I get calls when potholes start, when the snow uh, removal isn't good, and when the dandelions come. That's how I can tell the seasons change in our community. And this is an in perpetuity. This contracted spraying was looked to be almost in a pilot project sense that we would see if contracted spraying in one season would able to mitigate the growth cycle of dandelions. Dandelions, as explained to us, grow in a four-year cycle, if I remember correctly, and certain years are worse than others. If we were to get ahead, the worst, get ahead of the worst years in the non-spraying years, the dandelions wouldn't be as strong. So this is for a one-year spraying to be able to manage the growth of dandelions in our community. So there's now the motion's on the floor. Now we can debate it. Councillor Blackmore. Um, just to confirm uh, with um, Ms. Whiteway, this is in the 2023 budget, but not in the 20... Ms. This would add it to the 2023 budget, but not to the 2024, 25, or 26 budget. Uh, thank you, Mary Clayton. So it, a one time would only add it to the next year and it would not be added to the subsequent years. Um, I, I'm, a, I'm a really uh, crazy person when it comes to bees. I love bees. I think that they are very, very valuable to our uh, entire well-being as a society, as a, as a uh, uh, physical organism, which we all are. Um, so I cannot support this motion. However, I'm also, I'm also, uh, um, I like the idea that it's once every three years or every four years. Uh, if it has, if the rest of you pass the motion, I can live with that. 
Uh, just so we don't go down this path of bees, uh, Mr. Glavin, can you remind council what administration told us about bees, how this won't impact the bees because of the fact of, of the timing of it? Thank you, Mayor Clayton. I just need to refresh my memory on that. That's okay, I'll give you some time. Um, so yes, uh, the spraying would occur late in the summer, so it would likely be in August that uh, it would be applied uh, post most of the flowering that would occur. Yes, I understand it. Your, your uh, intent is to reduce the number of dandelions next spring um, or in, in the following year. I understand that. But I also know that uh, dandelions are the first flower that pops up and the number of dandelions uh, is related to the health of the bee population because of that. Um, so Perfect. there is, you cannot separate the two. Councillor Thiessen. Thank you, Mayor Clayton. So I won't repeat what I said before the motion hit on the table, but uh, I still mean every word. Uh, and I, I think this is coming from a good place, Mayor Clayton, but I, I, I still can't uh, totally, I can't get behind this. So. Uh, a couple of things. One of the points I wrote down. Thank you, Mr. Glavin, for um, for repeating it. But yeah, how we apply the spray has to be done in the in the late summer and fall, and we have to do it at low wind times. And I don't know if there's a not windy day in the in the fall of Grand Prairie, but that's where we get into the issues where uh, the spray can get onto other plants and foliage and trees and cause damage to those trees. And Mr. DeVries did say that in, in his report that he was given as why they are cautious about employing spray, even of a non-toxic variety. The other thing is, and this is going to sound outlandish, but I mean, the cost of food is going up all over the place. Now, when we spray a dandelion with anything, uh, it goes right into the root system. And dandelions are actually very edible and their use has have medicinal properties. I'm not saying we're going to harvest everything off our boulevards, but we could. Uh, and uh, I don't know if you were at Save On Foods uh, last week, but they had a big crop of dandelion leaves ready for sale in their, in their produce section. So there's lots of opportunities that we can maybe change how we look at dandelions and the solar flowers that they truly are. Uh, it's really only a two month period of time that we're dealing with this. And this solution isn't even gonna deal with it in this in this calendar year. So we're still gonna deal with the same complaints. And if it doesn't work, we're gonna deal with the same complaints in 2024 as well. So uh, I don't think I need to belabor any more words into this. Uh, you guys heard me before the motion. You're not hearing me after the motion. I got lots more. I could talk about this for hours, but I wanna save us time. So I am not in support of this. Councillor Plot. Uh, thanks, Mayor Clayton. Just to get the new person up to speed here, um, for this $20,000, are we saying we're going to spray all the grass in Grand Prairie along boulevards, parks, everywhere? Or where was this specifically just boulevards? Mr. Glavin. Thank you, Mayor Clayton. Uh, there was a map attached to the report, but essentially it's arterial roads. Arterial roads. Okay. Thanks for that. Um, I guess that makes a little more sense because I thought that was a seemed like an extremely good deal for the whole city. Um, I, I still can't support it though. I, I agree with most of Councillor Thiessen's comments and I, and I really do think um, we're talking about doing a major tree planting program and I think that'll actually alleviate both of the concerns on the top two lines in my opinion. So I can't support uh, the spending of $20,000 to spray weeds when I think we're trying to be more environmentally friendly. Councillor Bosch. Okay. Well, I think I'm going to vote for this because in favor because um, quite honestly, I'm curious to see what will happen. I'm curious that in the one in three years, uh, will there be a reduction over overall in the dandelion species? I think dandelions are relentless and they'll be back with a vengeance. There'll be plenty of flowers for the bees. It doesn't affect the bees in regards to spring at this point. Um, so until we get the naturalization in place, if this helps out for a short time period and we move into you know, naturalization and not worrying about spray, I'm, I'm for that. But I don't think we're even close to that at this point. Councillor Berg. Thank you, Mayor Clayton. This is something that I will support. Um, much like uh, the mayor, I hear a lot of complaints about dandelions, especially again, as people enter the city, I do want it to be attractive, and and I do not. I, I, maybe I'm in the minority, but I do not find dandelions attractive. Um, yes, they're nice and bright, 
but uh, they do eventually go to seed and, and spread. And I don't see that we will have a dandelion shortage annually for the bees. I just think uh, for the attractiveness of the city on these main corridors, I do support spraying. And so this is something I'll be in favor of. Earl Connor. Thank you, Mayor Clayton. Um, after going to the Bee Diagnostic Center in Beaver Lodge, I discovered that there's the dandelions that are an important part of uh, uh, sur supporting the bee uh, population uh, based on the scientists that was there. And that uh, uh, there are, I think, three, four different little seasons throughout the summer where different plants come up. So I uh, will be supporting this motion. I'm going to close on the motion. A couple comments that were made in regards to urban forestry. When you're walking through a forest and you don't see dandelions grown, that's because the tree canopy isn't necessarily letting light through. And the shedding of the trees have created a bed where dandelions aren't necessarily good to grow. Us clustering trees along a corridor is not going to prevent dandelions from go growing. You, a tree is not going to fight over dandelion for a little bit of water. A, a dandelion is a broadleaf weed and it needs to be removed. I think that corridors are the focal points of our community. By doing a pilot project for removing dandelions on a one-time basis for $20,000, I can tell you the emails that people reach out about the time that they spend in their yards that are adjacent to arterials that, I mean, never mind our uh, public utility lanes that we don't spray that impact people's yards, et cetera. We already spray sports fields and public grounds, but we're afraid to spray corridors where nobody walks on them. I think that this is a nice piece that will improve quality of life, will improve the aesthetics of our community, and I encourage council to support it. Mayor Clayton in favor. Council O'Connor, not in favor. All right. Uh, the other items on the screen, um, I'm not going to go through them line by line, but if there's any interest in these, jump in the queue, make a motion off the get go, and then we'll debate them. Councillor Blackmore. I would move that we include in the 2023 budget uh, $250,000 for contracted residential snow removal, $75,000 for transit stops, and $55,000 for additional removal of snow on trails and paths. So that motion's in order if anybody wishes to split. They can get in the queue and indicate that, uh, recognizing Councillor Plot. Thanks, Mayor Clayton. It's like you read my mind. I can support the first one, would like to support the second too. So no I motion is required. The, the, the items will be split. So speak to the one you choose to. So I guess maybe because I wasn't part of the conversation around why we went to seven and a half to 10 centimeters, I can support this. I think seven and a half centimeters is a little bit light on how much we think we need to be getting out there. I just think that's a unreasonable ask. And actually looking through some communities around Alberta, a lot of them are at 10. And so I don't know commercial applications would do it at seven and a half percent. So sorry, just to be clear, Councillor Blatt, that decision has been made. I realize that and I didn't get to speak to that. So because yeah. I didn't get to speak to that, I don't support this because I don't think this is necessary. I think. Sorry, sorry what you don't support is the addition of the contracted correct. residential. Correct. Yeah, I don't, I, I can't su support it because I also don't know if we're going to need it. I mean, it's nice to earmark money because we might need it. We don't even know if we're going to need this. If we need it, they'll get it done and they'll figure out the funding storm for us like we have in the past. I just think this is a $250,000 item that we're putting into the budget that we may not even need. And so I don't know why we'd want to put $250,000 as a placeholder in a budget that may not be needed. If there, if it snows nine more times, we're going to still do this in removal. If, it, if this is for an extra pass, if we need three more passes, they're going to do them. And so they're not going to come back and ask for us for money unless I'm rolling that administration. They're going to plow the roads. And so... I don't know why we need to put something in there if we don't know if we need it, so I can't support it. So just um, before I go to other questions or comments on the contracted residential snow removal is what we're debating right now. Mr. Glavin, can you remind the room at the seven and a half uh, centimeter criteria, administration's expectation is that we would need one more pass, but obviously 
nobody has a crystal ball in snow. So except for Councillor Thiessen. <laughs> Mr. Glavin, is there other context that you can provide? Thank you, Mayor Clayton. No, that uh, is what it looked like, is that based on the seven and a half centimeter trigger, it's likely we'd need okay. one more on average. Okay, Councillor Bressy. Thank you. Sorry, Mayor Clayton, I might have missed something, but I'm a little bit confused. You said the seven and a half decision was already made, but I thought that's what we were debating right now is if we're changing the trigger to 7.5 centimeters, which would have a $250,000 impact most years. Not to my understanding. Uh, my understanding is we're debating whether or not to add another rotation of residential snow removal. Mr. Glavin? Thank you, Mayor Clayton. So the snow and ice policy has not been revised to reflect the trigger going from 10 to seven and a half. And operationally, we haven't changed to reflect a seven and a half meter service or seven and a half centimeter service. So if this doesn't pass, um, we still plan to bring back the snow and ice policy for revision here shortly after budget's approved to reflect the decisions that were made here. So you're correct, the policy hasn't been passed, but without the funding, it may not pass. So. Yeah, and for for me, I don't want us to change this line in the policy. For me, I'm comfortable with the 10 centimeter. I know that there are some residents who very vocally think that we don't do enough, but I also think that our our review um, that we undertook supported that we actually are pretty aligned with other communities. And in some regards, we're offering a Cadillac service of of snow removal. Uh, and so for me, I don't. I think for me, saving money and putting it towards other community priorities is a higher priority for me than uh, making it easier for vehicles to pass. I think the difference between this and the other ones is I'm not hearing people are actually getting stuck on the streets anymore like they used to. This would be convenient, but this isn't actually going to help people get somewhere that aren't able to get there already. And so for me, I can't support this. It's different than the other types of snow and ice control we're going to talk about in a bit. Councilor O'Connor. Yes, uh, Mayor Clayton. Um, I would like to move to split. And uh, it's already been split. You don't need to move. Okay, so it has been done. Okay, I won't be supporting this one. So right, yeah, just so you're clear, Councillor O'Connor, we're currently debating the contract of residential snow removal. Yeah, the 250. Yeah, you bet. Yes. Okay, Councillor Keeson. Thank you very much, Mayor Clayton. I'll look intently into my crystal ball and see with my farmer's almanac what the snow yield will be this year. And uh, based off of history, it's about one in five years that we get a very large dump of snow. And I'm very proud of our snow removal system. It's, it's gone great. We went from filling in people's driveways to clearing out their driveways at a way reduced cost. I think this is probably a department that I'm most proud of for the efficiencies that they've been able to find. And to do one more pass is great. But even though we do five or six, there is sometimes a neighborhood that says, I only got one or two passes. And I don't know if this $250,000 will necessarily fix it. In the heavy snow yield years, we might have to do more passes because people will be getting stuck on the road. As uh, Mr. Glaffin said, we are, are going to be bringing that review back to council to, to approve of those. Um, I think this is, this is a nice to have, not a need to have. So um, my crystal ball says don't know. Councillor Bosch. Oh, I wish I had one of those too. <laughs> so for me, I'm going to vote against this motion. And for the reason of that is last year was a, an anomaly of, of snowfall. And I'm confident that if we do need that sixth round, as administration said, it will get done and we'll find the money for it. I, I have no fear that, you know, if if for some reason this anomaly is times two, um, will not have the money. Um, for me, I have more concern regarding ice. Ice, the sand, the salt, the, the conditions for the public driving uh, on this ice this last year was very, very difficult and a difficult uh, problem for the city to, to get behind as well because it, it's something we haven't had to deal with in the past. So no to this and more discussion on ICE. Thank you. Uh, Council Berg, and then I'm gonna go to Councilor Blackmore to close. Yeah, thank you, Mayor Clayton. So speaking to uh, Councilor Bosch's point, I think last season, one of those extra passes was exactly for ICE because it was getting to be two, three inches thick. And it, we had hoped it would melt and it didn't. And so, 
we had to go out even though there was no seven or ten centimeter snow it was required just due to the ice buildup and i could be corrected if i'm wrong mr clavin mr clavin thank you mayor clayton uh the, yeah that's essentially correct there was unsafe conditions in a number of neighborhoods that uh compelled us to go out and mitigate the issue right councillor blackmore to close if you'd like I was happy to make a motion to bring this to the floor for discussion, and I'm even happier to hear that greater minds will convey, will uh, um, bring this. Prevail. Prevail. That's the word I'm looking for. Thank you. So let's vote on this. Thank you. Call the question on the contracted residential snow removal. Councillor O'Connor. This, the motion is to support it. So if you don't want it, vote against it. Perfect. That is defeated, eight to one. Uh, now, as they are split, the second item that was split out is the transit stops. This motion is already on the floor. Discussion or debate on adding the $75,000 line item for transit stops. Councilor Bressy. Great, thank you. I'll speak to this and the next one because my thoughts are similar on there on them. I do support this. I think for, for me, um, removing, people literally aren't able to get where they need to get in our community because we're not removing snow from transit stops or from shells and paths, especially with transit, with transit stops, people with mobility issues I've heard have said, I just can't navigate buses safely in the winter. And so for me, this isn't a convenience. This is a, safety and a basic moving around our community um, ask. So I do support this being added into our budget. Okay. Councillor Bosch. I will support both of these as well uh, for the same reasons as Councillor Bressley. Safety is a, is a much different issue than um, sometimes convenience. So I will be voting in favor. Thank you. Um, just as a point of being aware of time, if you have something new to add, let's go that route. I don't want to hear you all say, yes, I love what they said. Thanks. Councillor Thiessen. Thank you, Mayor Clayton. Uh, I, I think uh, I'm in favor of this one and not necessarily the next one. Um, so I know we're saying a lot of both here, but we're only voting on one, which is the transit stops. Um, I think uh, I, can, I can agree that this is important, so we have people who uh, our uh, mobility challenge, you know, that need to get to these bus stops. And uh, I think for too long, people have had to trudge through the snow to get there and perhaps slip on the ice in some areas. And I think we need to have a mindful approach to, to a transit system and how people are getting to the transit system sometimes too. So uh, probably likely for most people, I'm very in support of this, but I will look forward to the debate on the next one. Councillor Blackmore, do you choose to close? Okay, call the question. O'Connor in favor. That carries unanimously. Moving on to the third item of additions. This is a motion to add snow removal to trails and paths to the amount of $55,000. Discussion and debate, Councillor Thiessen. Thank you very much, Mayor Clayton. Um, I know that we want to have a, a, a better, broader service for trails and pathways, and I think we've, we've established that. Uh, one thing that I've noticed since we decided that we were going to become a winter city is that our trails and pathways started getting like plowed a lot better, like through South Bear Creek, through um, Muscosipi Park, and then through our connector paths and trails uh, along 92nd. All that stuff gets done, and you know, in the past, it never really did get done. Um, I like what our administration has done here. I don't know if the $55,000 is going to get us that extra extra, um, but I would remind council that we also have an ask coming forward in our capital budget uh, on cross country ski equipment so that they can better track out like paths and trails in, in our South Bear Creek area and other places as well. So I feel like, um, in a sense, if we're going to make cross country trail pass with equipment that we're going to purchase, uh, whether that's going out to the community or just being used by our staff to track out things, 
I think that's already being done and we can do it within our existing budget. I'm very proud of, as an avid walker of our trails, uh, Councillor Platt can attest to that. I, I walk every day in and around the trails around this community and I am so proud of the work that our, our administration already does. I don't know how they could make it better. And so I think this $55,000 is potential to try to make it better. I just don't know if we'll see obvious results at the end of it. And uh, you know, with new cross-country ski equipment based upon where we vote, uh, that could be a way that we could track this out and give people more paths to walk along in nature. Thank you. Just so we're not making assumptions, Mr. Glavin, can you clarify for Remind Council what this $55,000 would add to snow removal on trails and paths? Thank you, Mayor Clayton. So essentially uh, on high priority trails, it'd be two days uh, and then lower priority trails would be four days and we'd accomplish that through two positions that would work on the night shift utilizing existing equipment. Um, Councilor Blackmore, do you wanna to wait to close or do you have a question? Director Glavin, can you expand on that a little and tell me what, what you mean uh, by priority one and priority two? Specifically, if we're, uh, if this budget is to remove snow so that people with mobility issues can get to the transit stops that we're gonna clean up so that they can catch the bus from those spots, um, I would have a different vote than if it was simply to increase uh, plowing on trails. Mr. Glavin. So the high priority trails would be any of the trails that are on the uh, arterial road network. Uh, in many cases, yes. Uh, Councillor O'Toole. Go ahead again, Mr. Glavin, please. Yes, yeah, so uh, the, pri the higher priority trails would be the ones on the arterial road network. So if you're on 84th Avenue or 116th Street or any of the uh, arterial roads that have trails are ones that we maintain. It would not be for sidewalks. So if it were a sidewalk, those would, um, I guess it would depend on the road, it would depend on the area, but generally speaking, the sidewalks are usually the adjacent property owner. Uh, however, the trails are maintained by the city. So the asphalt trails. My question is, we uh, voted to support the transit stop ice and snow control. Uh, would we be at that particular point in time? Uh, is the is there going to be a trail cleared off so they can get to the main road for the people in wheelchairs or walkers or strollers to the street to catch the bus? Glavin. Thank you, Mayor Clayton. Uh, generally speaking, unless it's on an area that we're responsible for plowing, no. Um, and I can confirm if I get any additional information, but I don't believe we would be extending the service oh. to other private property that is along the route to the trail. So if you're on say Mission Heights Drive where there's multiple bus stops, uh, it's the residential property owners who are responsible for clearing the ice to the bus stop and that would continue. Thank you. Thanks, Mayor Clayton. Um, maybe I'm missing something here, but I'm kind of with Councillor Thiessen. I, I drive my kids to school most day down 68th Ave. We, we O'Brien Lake in our community, and those trails are cleared out really timely already. So I, I'm just confused on how this is going to. I, I appreciate that it's going to have more frequency, but it seems like the frequency already is good enough. Like I'm, I'm kind of struggling with that because I haven't. I, I walk a little, not as much as Councillor Thiessen, but I definitely walk a fair amount, and I don't recall a lot of times where I was like, I'm trudging through a bunch of snow. Um, so I, I can't support this because I, I actually haven't seen it be an issue yet in the community for me. Rosh. Thank you. Um, I'm wondering if in part, some of this is communication to the public. If, if some of the issues are with the private landowner, maybe perhaps it's our obligation more as an enforcement piece. If we're already looking after our, our part and our trails are looked after well, um, and the other trails are not perhaps, maybe that's where we need to look at this through the lens we need to look at this through. So um, at this point, I, I don't think I'll support this because 
I said I was, but now we talked about it some more, so. <laughs> oh. So anyway, I see the I see the private piece being more of an issue than the public. Councillor O'Connor. Thank you, Mayor Clayton. Uh, just for clarification, uh, Director Glavin, um, on 115th, 16th, going east-west from uh, Mission Heights Drive, it, are the trails that go along those roads towards the mall, is that considered a trail and they will be cleared off? Mr. Glavin. Thank you, Mayor Clayton. Okay. I might need to be a little more specific uh, yeah. on that. So 115th Street or Ave? Uh, Ave. Okay. Uh, so is that because it's uh, on a boulevard and there are trees and there are uh, thing and you're plowing that road, but there's that path so people can get to the mall from up that end of town. Is that a, yeah, there's the lakes. Sorry. Thank you, Glad. 116. 116. Yeah. Thank you, Mary Clayton. So if it is an asphalt path, we would be clearing it as part of our operation. Thank you. That's perfect. Okay. Councillor Blackmore to close. Close. So this motion, if you vote in favor, will be to add snow removal on, sorry, increase the snow removal timeliness on paths and sidewalks. Paths and trails, not sidewalks, sorry. Councilor O'Connor, how do you vote? Not in favor. And that is defeated. Okay, one, two more items on the potentially added items list, and I'm gonna, from memory, say that, thank you. Um, the next one for consideration, but if nobody brings it up, GP Curling Club Center request for additional $117,000 in operating funding. Councilor Thiessen. Hey, thank you very much, uh, Mayor Clayton. Yeah, I would move that uh, we include this into our 20, 23 budget uh, and the full ask, uh, but uh, with the stipulation right now, I know uh, this is an ask that came out of our normal cycle. Uh, part of the ask was to help the curling club, club find sustainability in lakes. Uh, I know that I've, I've been lobbied by the curling club for a long time. Many of us have been uh, on this issue, and I think there's a good plan that was presented to our administration that over time would see a, a reduction in the services as they grew the, the club's membership and went from there as well as run their operations, their business and all that stuff. I'm not necessarily sure I agree with going outside of our, our regular community group funding standard, uh, but next year we will have that up for review and it should be open for application. And what I was saying to Mr. Griffiths right from the start was this is the way to address it. This is normally outside of our purview but I understand that the need is great here for you to find your legs and to grow this sport as, as you can. And I know much of their focus has been largely just on, on running the building and the operations and not necessarily doing the things that they could do through this. So um, I think it's, it's an all right ask for 117,000 this year. Uh, I'm hoping that working with administration, they'll find their legs in future years. They might come forward, probably will, with a community group funding ask, and then we can debate the amounts that are possibly given to them then. But I know how important and viable our curling club is to different residents in our community. Although the membership is dwindling, the number of people who appreciate the sport of curling is still great in our community, probably in the I would say at least 15 to 20 percent of our population total and probably a good 80 percent of people over the age of 40 are still interested in curling, curling events and watching and taking part. So um, this is a sports organization I'd like to continue to have here. We have a building we've already invested in and I want to make sure that um, for the fraction of the cost it would take for us to run this curling club and, and the building as well. Uh, I think we're getting a great deal this year and we buy ourselves and the curling club some time to evaluate the results and to see what our contributions might look like in the future, if any at all. So with that, I hope uh, you all will support this. Sorry, just for clarification, because based on your conversation, was this a one-time addition? Yeah, for me, this is just for this year. It's not uh, perpetual. That was the point of my questioning earlier um, and wh where I saw that it might be sliding because the original proposals I saw had a sliding ask, which we don't normally see. Normally, community groups 
come to us and their their requests are upward rather than downward. And so I appreciated the work that was put into that, saying, hey, we're going to wean ourselves off of the need for city funds. And I like to give them the legs to, to run with that and uh, hopefully not in perpetuity, but if they need it, uh, there is a method that they can request it. And that's typically through our usual channel of community group funding. Thanks. Thank you. Bressy. Needed a yes or no, but that's okay. <laughs> Council Bressy. Great, thank you. So, so yeah, I support this and actually wish it was uh, not just a one-year one year ask. For me, I don't see this as supporting a group. I see this as supporting a facility. I don't see this as giving funding to a user group, to a sports group, um, giving them funding that we don't give to other sports groups. I see this is where paying a, pro, a partner to run a city facility in a way that is, we heard is probably more cost effective than the city could do it. And I think when you've got not just the city running facilities, but other groups running them, you get more diversity in programming, you get more diversity in volunteers involved, all of that. So I think we're getting a good price to run that building and we should continue to fund this in perpetuity. That being said, with the city funding that facility, it's also incumbent on us to make sure that it's fully utilized. So I do, um, I am glad to hear the curling club having ideas to increase membership, increase utilization of their space. And I think we should give them time to do that. But I think in the next year or two, if that space isn't being fully utilized for curling, then we do have to have the tough conversation of, well, maybe it is just too much curling sheets of ice and we need to repurpose for other uses, part of the facility, not all, but we always need curling sheets here in Grand Prairie. Um, so yeah, that's my thinking on this. I'll be voting yes for this motion for sure. Councillor Blackmore. Um, I guess my question is, does the motion include the uh, restriction to 2023 budget? Um, is that the way, okay. Um, like Councillor Bressi, I would, I would have preferred to see this remain in the full budget, um, but I will support the motion for this year for certain. Um, I think that they've worked really hard and they continue to work really hard to bring a viable operation together. And I think it's through their hard work that we've seen uh, international and national curling events arrive in Grand Prairie. So um, I, I think they deserve the support of us uh, putting money into a facility that we own. I amend that and remove the budget year of 2023. Just remove Certainly that. I can try to pass an, get an amendment passed. Yes. Now, there's an amendment on the floor to amend this motion to not be for the 2023, to be for the four year budget. Correct? Yeah. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> so I'm going to clear the queue. And the only reason I say it can't be friendly because it needs to be debated. Yeah. Uh, so I'm going to clear the queue. If you'd like to discuss or debate the amendment, please get in the queue. Councillor Plott. Uh, thanks, Mayor Clayton. I'm in support of the original motion. I'm, I'm not in support of uh, making it a, a three-year ask. And I, and I do think it's, I'm worried that it won't have, the, the conversations won't happen and we won't get to some results we might get to if we just automatically fund it. I'm fine with funding it for 23 because I, I agree with everything that's been said. For 24 and 25, I don't know if I'd want to just start funding it until we have those conversations and much like this year, if it's if really needed next year, we can add it. But I, I don't know if I'd want to earmark the $117,279 specifically every year because um, I just don't know if that's what's going to be needed. It might be more next year. It might be more in 24 or 25 if, if, if things change. As well, just, you know. Yeah, so I, yeah, I can support the amendment, support the main motion. Councillor Bosch. Thank you. I think I, I would still support uh, the main motion only because it takes time to, oh no, the main motion has 2023 throughout. We'll take out the time. So I will support the motion. Um, the amendment. The amendment. Yep. Uh, because it does take time to, to transpire change, right? It doesn't happen within, you know, six months and eight months. And, you know, especially being a seasonal sport to top it off, um, I, think they, I think they need more time than one year. Thank you, Mayor Clayton. Yeah, so for me, I, I like it in, in perpetuity as well. 
and only because by the time we get the report, we find out what we need, we make the alterations, and um, yeah, you're throwing something out. Let's say it's an indoor soccer pitch um, when it's not a curling rink. Alterations have to be made. There's a process. There's time, and that will definitely exceed a one-year um, budget. So um, I'm fairly confident that uh, you know, at the speed of government that it will take longer than just one budget year to realize any potential changes. Uh, just so um, clarification so that everybody's aware, uh, Ms. Whiteway, if this amendment is passed, um, it would be funded for the next four years. However, if it was defeated and the original, if the amendment was defeated, the original motion that only has 2023 um, funded, would the subsequent years be left on the books unfunded? Uh, thank you, Mary Clayton. Yes, that's correct. Okay, so I won't support the motion. I think that there, I absolutely support the 2023. I think that it's a Councillor Bressie's comments. Supporting this facility is important. It's Councillor Thiessen's comments. Uh, this is a sport that we know that is a regional collaborative uh, sport to Councillor um, Blackmore's comments. They've brought great event tourism, sport tourism to our region as an organization that's volunteer led. Um, however, there, as we already know, we approved a engineering um, report to come back for approximately $45,000 that will come back to see the future uses to make this facility a year round facility. Without knowing that potential, I'm not comfortable funding it for the four year budget cycle. Um, as mentioned. So I do support it for 2023. I want to see what the possibilities are after we get that report back and therefore having it on the books unfunded is what I would prefer because it gives us an opportunity to come back and to discuss it later. Um, so I won't support the amendment but uh, I, will, I do support the intent of the main motion. Councillor Blackmore to close on the amendment. Um, Yes, I would ask you to support the amendment um, because I feel, first of all, it's a city facility. Uh, second of all, um, I don't see that it, uh, there's going to be any miraculous solution in the next 12 months. And uh, thirdly, because um, I feel for how exhausted that group of volunteers is trying to scrabble together uh, a reasonable financed operation at a time when it just hasn't been possible to do that. Um, so I would ask you to support the amendment. Right, that was a close. So this is on the amendment to keep the operating funding um, funded for the next four years. Question? Councillor O'Connor votes no. And that is carried. So now to vote on the amended motion. Uh, I don't see any need for, well, sure, actually, does anyone want to debate it? Being none, I will uh, call the question. Mayor O'Connor. In favor. That carries eight to one. And uh, one other item on our list was the eighteen hundred dollars asked for by Night Nighthawk. Uh, and Ms. Whiteway, can you just refresh the group high level what that was? I know that they recently were at council on Monday. Uh, my understanding is it's um, a top up on operations, but maybe you can just clarify, or Mr. Lemieux, that'd be great. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Clayton. Yes, so Nighthawk was in front of council just uh, uh, on Monday. They're basically asking for us to top up their uh, current approved funding to $50,000. And so the difference is uh, 1,815 is what their request is. All right. So looking for anybody interested to make a motion to top up Nighthawk's funding by $850 approximately. Councilor Burke. Yeah, I'd like to move that we top up uh, Nighthawks uh, funding by eight hundred and fifty dollars. So eighteen fifty. <laughs> oh, well, okay, one eight one five eight. Perfect. Fifty. Right. 
Right. So this is a motion to I'm give an extra fund the request as per Nighthawk when they came as a delegation. <laughs> Councillor Thiessen. Uh, what kind of budget impact is this going to have overall? Uh, no, I'm totally in support of this. It's okay. Thanks. All right. I don't see anybody in the queue. Call the question. Okay, and that carries unanimously. So that is all of the items that were deferred to the operating budget. Now, um, we only have 45 minutes scheduled. Is there anybody that needs a break or we can push through? Okay, seeing no one moving too quick. Uh, introduction from Ms. Whiteway um, for the capital budget discussion. Uh, thank you, Mayor Clayton. Oh, it's here through to capital. Um, I was hopeful to uh, just give a quick, would you like a quick update on Perfect. all the decisions made from operating yep. and what that means for That'd the taxes? Great. Okay, great. So uh, based upon the uh, motions made and the amendments to the proposed budget, uh, it will be a 3.26% increase for 2023. Just for Mr. Galbraith or anybody else who's watching, that is not a finalized budget amount of an increase of 3.26. Thanks. If you wanted to introduce capital now, that'd be great. Okay, thank you, Mary Clayton. Um, Okay, so within uh, your deliberations uh, agenda package, you have a very detailed uh, listing of five years of capital. Um, again, a reminder that we're looking for approval for 2023 um, with the subsequent years approved in principle. So the capital projects that uh, we've proposed for uh, 2023 are a total of 40588000 uh, These do not these do not uh, include those that were referred to budget and will be discussed later. Um, our capital projects um, are funded from a variety of sources. We have capital tax uh, reserves. We have federal funding, the Canada Community Building Fund. We have provincial funding, uh, which is the Municipal Sustainability Initiative, um, as well as uh, the use of debentures and council strategic initiatives. There's a number of projects uh, throughout. Uh, however, the largest investment being proposed is uh, roads and infrastructure with a total of 29173000 One thing that I'd like to um, go through is just, just to remind Council of the changes in funding that we've seen for capital uh, over the last number of years and looking forward into the future. So um, with our capital, uh, we did see much higher levels of specifically MSI um, in the past. This is decreased um, over, this is decreased now to 7.2 million and we have uh, projected throughout our budget that this is where it'll remain. So um, you'll see here that there will be a requirement uh, to gradually increase capital tax to help support capital projects going forward. And this is something that was discussed and approved at uh, 2020 budget deliberations, and we have um, been gradually increasing capital tax uh, throughout. And that is my introduction to uh, capital for today. Perfect. I see you in the queue, Councillor Bressy. I just wanted to... Um, let council know of the process that we're going to go through here. It'll be similar to operating. We will go by a uh, bucket of administration. Um, and what I'll suggest is that as we go through the identified items on pages 22 and 23, 24 and 25 of your budget book, if, as I call them out, if you want to flag the item, get in the queue. If you don't, we'll just keep moving along. So, Councillor Bressy. Great, thank you. Just going back to the last graph that you showed, it looks like your um, forecast for MSI LGFF is just level what it was in 2022. Is that correct? Uh, thank you, through the mayor. So uh, I would say it's because we're uncertain of what we're going to get. So uh, I've left it there for projections. Uh, there is a likelihood that it could be further reduced from what we're seeing today. 
Yeah, no, I think that's a good prediction for 2023, and then I anticipate it'll go up after 2023. But just wanted to make sure that it, that line actually was level because it's hard to tell that skill. All right, so I'm gonna um, I'm going to start with financial and administrative services. Um, there are items there under uh, geographical and information technology services. I will ask if anybody has items in that bucket, which include business application and upgrades, corporate initiatives, counselor, breast, or boss. No, nope. sorry, municipal wireless project, uh, security and disaster recovery, counselor Bosch. Thank you, Mayor Clayton. Uh, so my, my questions for security and disaster recovery and video surveillance in the next one as well. Is what is that related to? Um, is what um, is it Stonebridge? Is it um, yeah? I don't know what it's related to. So possibly Ms. Whiteway, you can give further explanation on what the capital tax item is on the security and dis disaster recovery, as well as the video surveillance. Thanks, hey, Mayor Clayton. So with security and disaster recovery, that's a corporate initiative. So um, that's to protect the data that the city has. Um, it's to ensure that we have backup and recovery, um, which we have at City Hall and Eastlink. So we are looking to do in um, a required uh, upgrade to that. So it's an end of life um, necessity to ensure that we are uh, protected. For video surveillance, if you just want to bear with me one moment. Um, again, this is uh, this is our corporate uh, video surveillance initiative. So um, it is a life cycle for hardware, software. Um, the project is going to update and maintain video surveillance throughout the throughout city facilities. So it's not specific. Okay. So the 180,000 for data and recovery that already isn't part of corporate IT initiatives. So how are they different is what I'm looking at. So in the future, we're going up to 575,000 then 715,000. None of the data and recovery is in that bucket already. Right away. Uh, thank you, Mary Clayton. Um, for, are you asking, sorry, just to clarify um, corporate IT? Yeah, I'm just curious in this corporate IT initiative. So. It, it increases in 2025 and 2026. And right now we have um, the data and recovery in 2023. Do those not all fall in the same bucket as far as uh, corporate IT initiatives? Thank you, Mary Clayton. No, uh, we do separate out those types of projects. So um, the uh, corporate IT initiatives uh, encompasses our network um, infrastructure, so hardware, software uh, processes that provide the communication path and services uh, throughout the city. So it, it's different than security and disaster recovery. Okay, thank you. All right, Councillor Berg. Yeah, thank you. So my question is around uh, the municipal wireless project. Um, I know personally, I've, I've actually forgotten the network on my phone for any of the city facilities because it is so slow to load anything. And and I'm fine with that. I just have lowered my expectations on it. But I see, again, 12,000, 132, 12,000, and then 462,000. Is that eventually in 2027 the plan to rebuild the entire system? Or or can you elaborate on that, please? Ms. Whiteway? Uh, thank you, Mary Clayton. Um, I can elaborate a little bit here on 23, and then I'll uh, get back to you on the future years. Um, on the 2023 is just a, um, we're replacing and improving our current equipment uh, for traffic control devices okay. in the city. So they do rely on our wireless uh, network to, to work. So um, that's what the 2023 is. And I will let you know what uh, the bigger project is in future. Okay, and that's actually something that I hadn't considered, that it is actually city infrastructure versus public use Wi-Fi. Thank you. Correct, yeah. I just had a question, and it could be that I'm just my getting t tired towards the end of the day, but what does your line on the slide mean, one project carrying forward that was previously approved by council? Uh, yes, thank you, Mary Clayton. So that would be the uh, third year of the ERP project. So that okay. was 
uh, 800,000 for 2023. Okay. Uh, so we will come back to discussion and debate. This is an opportunity as we go through these lines for questions for administration. Um, DIS Digital Ortho, no implications for 2023, ERP system procurement and implementation, and enterprise asset management implementation. Um, so I see no questions. Actually, I had one. Um, on item, uh, no, I'll wait till I get to operational services. Okay, Councillor Plot. Uh, thanks, Mayor Clayton. I just have a question about the asset management implementation in 2024 for $2 million. I'm, I guess I'm just curious if that could be slid. And the, re the reason I'm asking that is we're, we've been working on ERP for, I think, three years now. And it's not fully operational and implemented to where we're seeing the benefits. I'm just wondering if we should take a pause at some point. It feels like, I mean, as, again, year cap, but in five years, we've been constantly adding systems and, and going and going. I just wonder at some point if we need a gap of a year to actually get our systems running and operational before we add another layer on. But I'm curious if that's got major implications to the organizations if we were to slide that by a year. Ms. Whiteway? Uh, thank you, Mayor Clayton. So it, it originally was planned for 2023. We did slide it to 2024 for, for that reason and give some space and time for ERP to settle. And our, our hope was that with um, we would enter the sustainment phase of ERP throughout 2023, that would also give us space for finalizing some asset management policies and procedures and um, bring those forward to, to council for approval. It also gives us um, time to review our existing data, our existing systems. There's a lot of work ahead, but we were confident that if um, approved for 2024, so not next year, the year after, that we would have time to plan and be able to start implementation at some time in 2024 with, with that ask. Okay, okay. Thanks. Seeing nothing else in that bucket, we'll move on to Invest GP. Under the enter events and entertainment bucket, we um, have Bonnet's Energy Center box office accessibility. Councillor Berg. Thank you, Mayor Clayton. Around the box office accessibility, um, I'm assuming that that is for wheelchair access primarily which would require lowering a window. From an outsider point of view, that 100,000 seems a bit excessive. Um, what are we looking to do to lower that window or or what what's the options there? Sorry, Brian. Mr. Lemieux. Thank you, uh, Mayor Clayton. Um, so the 100,000, you're correct, it is to lower the, the entire counter and replace windows so that it is wheelchair accessible. Uh, and 100,000 is based on a quote that we received. Uh, it is all custom cabinetry, so it is quite expensive. So that's based on a quote. Right, so we're doing every window as opposed to one? Mr. Lemieux? Uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'll get, have to get back to you in terms of exactly what we're, how much we're doing. I don't believe we're doing the entire, uh, all the windows. I believe we're doing a section, but I'll, I'll confirm that. Okay, yeah, thank you, because when I go to the bank, there is always one bill that is lowered. Um, again, to me, that 100,000 just seems excessive. But again, I haven't seen the scope of the project. So we'll get some information back on that one. Councillor Blackmore. Um, I'm having trouble with all of the uh, uh, capital requests, both uh, for 2023 and 2024 for the Burnett Center. Um, you know, we were supposed to fix the roof and then we didn't fix the roof because um, sorry, it was going to be too hard, I think. I I just... So right now, sorry to interrupt, we're going to deal with box office accessibility. Then I'll come to the other. They come one after the other. I know, but if you could just hold off, we'll have any okay. kind of discussion on some of the items identified. As a user of the Bennett Center, it seems to me that it's less than two years ago that we did a reconstruction of the front counter of the Bennett Center. So I'm questioning why we are um, doing that work once again. Okay. Mr. Lemieux, do you have any additional information or Mr. Miller at this time? 
Mr. Miller. Uh, thanks, Mayor Clayton. So I've been advised that it, it's only one section, which uh, is similar to what you would see in a bank, and it's where the, the ticket master window used to be. And it's on the far south end of the, the counter okay. system. So um, does that provide the information required, Councillor Berg? Yeah, I guess so. Okay. So I'm going to come back to Councillor Blackmore's items in a minute. Councillor Bressy, do you have comments on the box office or accessibility, I guess, questions for administration? Yeah, thank you. I'm just trying to get a sense of, um, so what happens now when somebody in a wheelchair rolls up there and they're looking for service? I'm assuming we're not just turning them away from the game altogether. So what are, what are we doing now and what exactly are we saving if we do this in those efforts? Mr. Miller? Thanks, Mayor Clayton. I think we're just doing our best to accommodate them right now, and maybe the, the person behind the window comes around to uh, provide service if needed. And do we know, is this creating, is this about just more dignity for the person at the window? Is it creating major operational challenges? Are we still, for the most part, I totally get why it's far from ideal, the person at that window, but are we, um, are there big operational issues with uh, with serving them right now? Are we are, are we having troubles accommodating them? Thanks, um, Mayor Clayton. Just one moment, please. Yeah. I don't have any information if it's created a, a real operational challenge, but there has been an initiative to uh, make our facilities more accessible. So this is part of the, that as well. We've had discussions with Mr. Uh, Phillips in the past about putting this on his list of uh, projects. Yeah, no, totally. And I've been a big proponent of that. So I totally appreciate that. I don't want to take money away from accessibility. Just wonderful. Get a hundred more bang for our bucks with a hundred thousand elsewhere, but definitely not meaning to defund accessibility in general. I can just add one more comment. Uh, we are anticipating that the cost will be less. This seemed like a, a bit of a high estimate that we received. So we'll certainly do our best to bring it down. Okay. Um, Councillor Bosch, if it's a question on this accessibility, great. If not, I'm going to, I have another comment. Go for it. Thank you. Uh, well, you know, we as a city offer accessibility grants. So if we're not, uh, you know, walking the walk or rolling the roll for our own, then I think uh, we need to take a look in the mirror. So um, if it's needed, it's needed. All right. Uh, if I could get a motion to go in camera. Councilor Bressy, thank you. Um, all those in favor? Unanimous. Thank you. Okay.